My guest today on my program is Dr. Brian Clug. Brian Clug is a promoter of human rights, a teacher, a writer, but above all, a philosopher and a good human being. It's a pleasure to have Brian on my program today and to get his vision, the vision of a philosopher of our one world. Brian, thank you for coming to the show. It's a pleasure thank to you. be here. Thank you us. very much. Brian, can I ask you a question which is very much on your turf, as it were? Socrates said, I'm a citizen of the world. Mm. What do you say, Dr. Clug? Well, what a nice, unexpected opening. Thank you. <laughs> and I think the significance of that statement is that Socrates was essentially saying, I am a human being and not just an Athenian. And this raises a whole host of questions about what it means to have a particular identity and what it means to be part of common humanity, which I'd be happy to talk about. Well, <coughs> it is really about our place as human beings on this world. Mm. So yes, it would be interesting to know how we can actually live in harmony together. I think that is the key, the key question, or, the, or, or to quote Stuart Hall, the late cultural theorist, he said, how can, he asked the question, how can people live together in difference? And this, I think, is a key question for our age because our one world is a shrinking world. It's a world where people are bumping up against each other now all the time in their difference. And the question is, how can we make space for each other? How can we share a common space in a limited uh, and finite world? So how can we? I think there are two uh, dimensions to this. One has to do with how we treat the planet, and the other has to do with how we treat each other. So if we talk about each other first. OK. I think we have to understand that humanity comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, colors and flavors, um, and that the um, different identities we have, whether it's Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, whatever it may be, is a variation on the theme of being human, where there is no theme without the variations. The variations make the theme. Make the theme, exactly. Yet it also divides. Absolutely. And so how do we reconcile that issue, right. the variety and the, yes. and the symphony and the harmony that we yeah. can create where variety of people can live together and enjoy that variety, enjoy that difference rather than divide by that difference? Well, I think you put your finger on the, on the central paradox uh, for human beings today and how they relate to each other. On the one hand, the very thing that could unite us divides us. So how do we overcome that? Um, but so before you yes, say that, can yes. I ask you this? What do you think is the biggest points that divide us? Is it religion? Is it, is it color? Or is it, what, what do you right. think is the biggest hurdle, if you like? Okay. Any point of difference between people is potentially a dividing okay. factor. But religion today, what we call religion, is proving to be divisive. And I want to suggest, and I'll do this as briefly as I can, Please. a completely different way of thinking about religion. Because we tend to talk about religion as though it's a set of beliefs that one person asserts and another person denies. But I think it's better to think of a religion as a kind of grand human tradition, whether it's, again, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Think of it like a well on, from which people drink if they adhere to that tradition. One well, really. One well, because exactly, yes. because although there are lots of different wells, they're all fed by the same subterranean river. Right. And it's the water underlying all the different wells from which each of us drinks that unites us. The different wells distinguish us from each other. But if we understand that at bottom, at depth, the water, as it were, that is feeding Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, it's and so on, is the same water, that's how I think we can come to assert a common humanity. And do you think, uh, just talking a little bit more about religion, because mm. in my view, certainly, it is the biggest point of division. Yes. 
Um, do you think that religion has outlived its purpose? You know, it was a message of love at mm. one time, right. an inclusive message of love. Now it's become a force for division, uh, a force for mm. hijacking, mm. Uh, you know, human values and dividing people. So. Yet I understand philosophically, it's, <laughs> yes. a, it's nice to look yes. at it from as well, but yes. we have a practical problem yes. in this world. Right. Um, <coughs> the way I look at it is this. Um, religious traditions are in a position where they need to maybe rethink their own sources, their own meaning. So it's not so much perhaps a question of religions being outdated or outmoded, but more a question of going back and rethinking what they're about. So you talk about the message of love. If that message has got lost in the way in which a religion is being practiced, then there's something that needs to be recovered. And that is for the adherents, if you like, of that tradition or that religion, I think, to attend to. I guess my, my point was this. Is it, yes. is it expedient, more expedient to, to ditch the religion <laughs> rather than try and right. retrieve right. it from its right. roots? because. The force of time, the rituals that have accumulated, mm. Mm. have become so complex right. that to actually retrieve something may be more difficult than to simply start either something new or, right. or if you see the point I'm making. I do see the point, yeah. and I understand, I think, the, the reason for, si for, for making that point. But I think that religion isn't something that can be simply ditched and the reason is that it's more than just religion it is a whole set I mean take uh, my case I'm Jewish yes. and Judaism for me is what it's a set of references a collection of texts it's a vocabulary it's a sense of humor it's a way of approaching life it's symbols and so on and all of that is what you might call the marrow of Judaism that's not something that I, for example, could simply discard. But what I can do is dip into that well and drink from the water in it that is fed by, that feeds the same uh, water in the wells of other traditions I and religions. It's very beautifully put, Brian. Mm. But let's, uh, let's move to some of the um, practical problems that we're seeing these days. Yeah. And uh, one of the things which is really disturbing is the extent of refugees. Yes. Refugees in different parts of the world, refugees coming to Europe, mm. refugees in Bur from Burma, and many other parts of the world. Mm. I mean, why is it that we in the land of plenty do not welcome them and understand and help them? We seem to put hurdles Right. Uh, what is it that we should be seeking to do? Well, that I think goes to the heart of this whole series, and it goes to the phrase, our one world. Maybe I can just say something about what that phrase means of to course. me, because it will lead to an answer to your question. Um, in modernity, <coughs> modernity, we behave as if you know, the world were an empty space where there are infinite resources, and we are in competition with each other in a struggle for existence. Our one world, that phrase, suggests almost the opposite idea to me. It suggests the idea of the planet as a limited space with finite resources that we all have to share, which means moving from a struggle for existence to a struggle for coexistence. And it's the struggle for coexistence, I think, that would mean the beginning, if you like, of a new dawn, where instead of thinking about excluding other people, people who are fleeing situations of warfare or famine where it is impossible to live a human life decently, we would say, come and join us because this is a mutual joint enterprise called coexistence, living together. That's what our one world very, means to me. Very well put, actually. However, it seems that human beings are so greedy Yes. Uh, we are always fighting for our own space, for our own material right. uh, values and goods. Um, that we forget, um, that we forget right. to welcome other people and share. So it's intrinsically uh, counterintuitive. I mean, yes, it's 
Absolutely. It's good of you to say that, but how are we going to okay. change? Well, you may, you, may, uh, you may take issue with my answer to this question, <laughs> because for me this goes <coughs> back to the previous question. I think the answer to that is to draw on the best in our respective traditions, the best of Judaism, the best of Islam, the best of Christianity. If I can do that uh, to illustrate the point, you have a story in the Bible of Abraham sitting in front of his tent and three strangers appear and his reaction to that is to welcome them and to offer them hospitality. And that seems to me to be a model. I draw that from my tradition. Other traditions I think have similar resources, a model of how to treat the refugee, the foreigner, the stranger, the migrant and so on. Occupy your own premises, sit in front of your own tent, but welcome the stranger when they enter your domain. So, uh, so is it, uh, yes, I can see the, the spiritual mm -hmm. um, illustration that mm -hmm. you're making, Brian, but the problem is that we are in a world, it seems in the Western world at mm. least, where politics, for example, and capitalism oh, yes. is moving us in a different direction, is yes. moving us from coexistence mm. to actual mm. the quest for material success mm. and so on. Yeah. Uh, and, and if I may say so, talking about politics, um, do you think democracy, in a sense, has, mm. has broken down? Right. Well, I, I share the concern that you are expressing, or at least implying, about the whole direction that the world is going in, which is why I think your theme of our one world is so vital, to recall people back to some focal point when there is all this fragmentation and divisiveness. Um, I, who has an answer to these questions, but in my view, the way forward is indicated by, you mentioned that, I'm a, that I promote human rights, and in my view, it's, it's indicated by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Because that document, which is often misunderstood, has at its very core the uh, sentence that opens the preamble, which says, uh, uh, talks about recognition of the inherent dignity of all members of the human family. And then Article 1 says all human beings should treat one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Now, if you read all the other articles in the light of those two statements, exactly. you have a basis, right, for a politics and an economics for the future. And may I just say that I saw this in action last year when I was taking part in a conference organized by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, the FRA. Big gathering, over 700 people, all 28 governments in the EU represented, and there was something like a consensus in the room that the way forward, the way to deal with the economic problems, the problems of migration and political problems is on the basis of human rights. The following day was the result of the referendum in the UK and the decision to leave Europe. So I feel I share your concern about the fragmentation, the divisiveness, but I believe the way forward is to base our politics, our planning, our economics on the principle that there is inherent dignity in every member of the human family. I think, <coughs> I think if people followed that, um, hmm. that declaration, yes. I think we would have a different world. But, right. but sadly, politicians don't seem to follow it. And I think politics and democracy is not working. I mean, Brexit yes. is, I, in my opinion, hmm. a good example Mm. where people are looking back and saying, I think we made a mistake. Sure. What is, because, what is your view? I mean, is, 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 should okay. we follow democracy and decisions irrespective of whether we made mistakes? Right. My view basically is this. People were faced with, with a choice when the a referendum yeah. was held in which they were not offered an alternative vision of the future. They were not offered an inspiring ethical vision that would hold us all together and focus people on our one world. Consequently, they reverted to the past. They gave in to nostalgia. They said, we want our country back. We want our glory back. We want back. We want to go back in time. I think that the onus on politicians is to promote a, an ethical vision that focuses people's minds on the future, not on the past on unity, not on division. I think 
Plato said one of the penalties for refusing to participate in politics oh, yeah. is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. Uh -huh. I think we are being governed by our inferiors. What do you think? Right? Never in my lifetime have I seen such a low caliber <laughs> of politician at the top. And it doesn't matter which party. I mean, we all have our allegiances, but I am struck by the poverty of leadership, I'm afraid. More or less across the board, there are noble exceptions, and uh, let's not mention names because that's invidious. But on the whole, I'm also struck by the low caliber of, of leadership, and of course it's personified by a certain president of a certain country at the moment. So, <coughs> is it because, <coughs> is it because we, sorry, I wouldn't say the more intelligent person, uh, is not more involved in politics. Mm. We allow, we, we sort of stand back and allow the inferior mm. people to, mm. to, as it were, uh, rule. <laughs> is that is that what's happening, or is it something wrong with the public at large who cannot recognise a good person? That's an interesting question. I don't have a quick answer to that, but I do think that the public, at the moment, public debate, let's put it that way, is being corrupted by. Uh, the new social media, which has given license to people to just sound off, you know, and um, say anything they like. And this has had the effect, whilst I value the liberty and the freedom, of course, nonetheless, the effect has been to lower the standard of public debate. And I think you mentioned Plato, you mentioned Socrates. One of the features of Athenian democracy over 2,000 years ago was public debate. People would come together and they would argue, and you can see the quality of that argument reflected in the texts that have survived from that period, from ancient Greece. Today, the standard of public debate is so low. The debate over Brexit was pathetic. Yes. Of course, Plato also sort of predicted, didn't he, that tyranny springs from democracy. Yes. And, and yes. I just, I, still yeah. staying there, right. I, I'm not hopeful yeah. I'm not hopeful that we're leading to a more democratic or more, yeah. mm. more enlightened right. way to, to, of politics. Right. I believe in democracy as the best political system, but I believe in that uh, because I believe that it reflects the idea uh, which I said is at the heart of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which you could also call the Universal Declaration of Human Respect, right? mutual respect. And that is the principle of the inherent dignity of each individual. But just as religion is ambiguous, it can be divisive and it can also be inspiring, so democracy is ambiguous because the demos, the people, can turn into a mob. And that's how Plato saw democracy turning into tyranny. And then you had the rise of the, rise of the demagogue the person who is uh, a populist and who appeals to the lowest instincts in, as it were, the herd or the mob. I think we are seeing that. And we are that. seeing that in, mm. a certain, in certain cases. And um, <coughs> you mentioned uh, social media. Mm. It's, um, it's sort of a blessing and a curse. Yes. I'm, uh, by social media, I also mean the internet and, and the material yes. that goes on the internet. Yet, yet, the misinformation, the manipulation yes. that takes place exactly. uh, is very dangerous. Yes. I think a blessing and a curse is a good way of summarizing the human condition, actually. I mean, you know, where anything that we have or that we touch is ambiguous. We're always confronted, in a way, with the question, how do we use this to, for better or for worse, for good or for bad? And there's no escaping that. There's never going to be, I think, a solution in that sense to human problems because we are the problem. All one can say is that the potential in this social media is not something to be dismissed, but there needs to be a fully fledged debate about how this new instrument that has come into our uh, and to our lives is, is handled. Yes, it is going to be a challenge, Brian. Um, uh, but staying again with political systems for a little longer, we see the rise of Chinese socialism. Yes. It's almost following the old Greek 
style of of having wise people mm -hmm. uh, manage and make good decisions on mm. behalf. Mm. Democracy doesn't always produce the best people. If we could choose the wisest people to, as it were, guide us politically, right, right. Um, and and also at the same time behave in a sort of socialistic mm. or I think, mm. as you put it, a, a mutual, uh, mutual mutual way of caring and right. being together or having. Yes. Mutual right. rights. Right. Does that sound um, like a good alternative? The, the, as I see it, the problem with any alternative to a democracy which gives everybody equal status is, the, if you look his, look back over time historically, is that it tends to turn into something oppressive. So, <coughs> although in theory you might say a group of wise people. That would be the best way to govern society. In practice, that becomes, time and again this has happened, it becomes oppressive. And partly this is because people don't agree on the definition of wisdom. And <laughs> people don't share the same idea of the common good. And that's precisely the strongest, that's one of the strongest arguments for democracy, which is to say we have to argue these things out. And there's never an end to that argument. The issue is how well we argue. And that's where I think the problem with the social media comes in, it, 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 it disrupts the quality of that argument. Uh, we talked a little bit about not just human beings living with each other, mm -hmm. but our world yes. uh, is, uh, is yes. also, and we are blessed right. by having animals and plants yes. and, and beautiful oceans and rivers. And yes. We live in a beautiful world, Absolutely. yet we don't think that we, it, a lot of people don't think it belongs to them and therefore don't care about it or right. preserve it for you know for, right. for the next generations right um, I like the way you put it we live in a beautiful world not just a plentiful world and I think again with modernity there was this idea of a kind of license that human beings have to exploit nature in whatever way they they wish it went along with the rise of exploitation of each other so just as I think the answer to the question of human belonging is that we treat one another with respect on the basis of an inherent dignity that each of us has, so I believe with the planet. That's to say, to recognize it too has a kind of inherent dignity, what you call beauty, right? Um, so it's not only that it's finite, it's not only that we have to learn to live with limited resources, we also need to, in a way, wake up and look and see and appreciate right, the setting in which human beings are placed. May I say, coming back to the earlier question, that this is something one can find in a number of different religious traditions. So when, for me, as a Jew, Genesis opens with the creation of the world and God says it is good, that to me is an affirmation before human beings are even on the scene. That is an affirmation of the inherent dignity of creation. And I think we need to find that uh, too from whatever sources we, we draw on in order to achieve our one world. I mean, do, do you, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm uh, out of sync, but does it not all derive from the greed that human beings want to exercise, the greed for more material things, the greed to exploit the things that are around them for our own, not just good, right. but more. Yes. The, the need for more and more material things means we're utilizing animals, yes. we're abusing animals, we're, right. we're using the natural world around us just right. for the sake of having plenty. Yes, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think greed is also what Plato saw as the ultimately leading to tyranny, in fact, because th the insatiable appetite won't stop at anything until finally, at least in Plato's sort of description of this in the Republic, it leads to someone who promises to give you everything you want but in fact, of course, imposes his will on everybody else, and that's the, that's the tyrant. That's a beautiful way to put it. 
also connected with that mm. is the disparity of finance. Yes. You know, I think it's yes. uh, the many uh, yeah. statistics, but 71% of the population yes. only benefits from 3% right. of the wealth. Yes. I mean, this sort of disparity yes. is actually is divisive. It's, it's resentful. Mm -hmm. And with this feeling, this resentful feeling, mm. comes a lot of this uh, reaction. Yes. Uh, I completely agree with you. So if you put the two things together, greed on the one hand and resentment, even, even legitimate, justifiable resentment on the other, you have two forces that are converging uh, to produce conflict and to produce misery. So the, 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 the two sides, I think, of one coin, the greed on the one hand and the resentment on the other. But in the, if I may go back to the Universal Declaration of Human <laughs> Rights, it does address this question, though people don't seem to notice it. <laughs> it's not only about civil liberties and the right to freedom of uh, speech, it's also about the right to a decent standard of living. And it's a, it, it addresses these questions in clauses that have been overlooked and insufficiently uh, understood. That's why I think it's the overall vision of the Universal Declaration of Human Respect <laughs> that we need, not just focusing on certain clauses and taking them out of context. So do, do you think that, um, again, uh, just turn, turn to your favorite um, uh, philosopher, Plato. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his dualistic view of the spirit and, mm. and, and which continues and for infinity and mm. perhaps even reincarnation, who knows? Yeah. Um, and of course, the material aspect of our lives, yes. which is finite and, and, right. and comes to an end. Sure. Uh, do you think that developing our spirituality, you know, mm -hmm. and putting that in perspective, would help us understand, as you say, the Declaration of Human Rights? Because <laughs> it's almost like the Ten Commandments. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is that? <coughs> I, I think, of course, I mean, it depends what one means by, by spirituality, but I think that... Meaning a feeling of, creating a feeling of peace and contentment within yes. yourself. Yes. Because yes. only from within ourselves do yes. the changes arise. They yes. do not yes. really come with yes. words being imposed upon you. Right, right. You have to understand those words and feel them yes. and react to them. Now, I think it's, it's, it's a re another conundrum, because on the one hand, as you've also been implying, there are changes in the material conditions of people's lives that are needed. This kind of disparity of wealth is something that we can't live with forever. It has to change. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. No external change is going to accomplish what, as it were, we aspire to for human beings. That requires a kind of internal change, what I guess you're indicating with the use of the word spirituality. And the conundrum is, how do these two things relate to each other? And in a 20-minute conversation, <laughs> we can't possibly answer that. Well, uh, you've, you've answered uh, in, a, in a way beautifully uh, so the end summary of what we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the material um, mm -hmm. coexistence and sharing and yes. a spiritual enlightenment, as it were. Yes. yes. Uh, so y y I'm going to ask you a, a final sort of question. Sure. In many ways, our conversation doesn't show a great deal of optimism about mm. the way we are living our lives and where mm. we're leading to. Mm. Uh, Brian, if you, uh, if you had one wish for the world, mm -hmm. what would you say? I suppose it would be, to go back to something I said earlier, it would be a fundamental change of an approach to life. Instead of seeing life as a struggle for existence against each other, to see it as a struggle for coexistence with each other. That's the change that I would like to say. What a beautiful way to end this conversation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Thank you for us. Thank you.